Hi everyone, Future Nimta here. To make a bit of a note on this, first of all, sorry for how late this video is. My editor got married and I also had my own life things happening. So we kind of got this out late. But in note of that, number one, I recorded this video before FromSoft hatched the DLC of Elden Ring. So a lot of my points I make here have been addressed. Some of them are still valid, but some of the difficulty curve of the DLC, big one being that Radon, the final boss battle, I know, spoilers, but if you haven't got that far in the DLC yet, I assume you either have given up or you're not going to get that far. So yes, spoiler, the final boss is Radon again. But the final boss fight has been patched and nerfed some. Uh, many of us believe that uh, probably use a little bit more tweaking and patching but neither here nor there has been addressed. Also, at the time of when I first recorded this, I had not played Sekiro or Rise of P or the original Dark Souls. At the time of me recording this note, I am well into the DLC of Dark Souls 1 and have played both Sekiro and Rise of P. So I will say that I have noticed that many of the issues in Elden Ring are not present in some of the older games. Some of them are, some of them aren't. Many things have been addressed and made better, and some things are still there. But ultimately, I would say that Elden Ring is mechanically better than the original Dark Souls. But there are some levels of the difficulty that are just ridiculous. I also have not played the original Demon Souls yet even still to this day, and that is largely because even the remake is PlayStation exclusive. But I just wanted to make that small note and before anyone may mention that many, many of these issues have been addressed. I am aware, yes. But thank you guys and I hope you enjoyed the video all the same. To feel fulfilled, you must first have a goal that needs fulfilling. Same time it must actually be possible to fulfill their goal. Itataki Miyazaki. Too many people are afraid to say this, but the truth of the matter is, Shadow of the Earth Tree was not a good DLC. In fact, I could honestly say it suffers from major design flaws that the base game also suffered from. Flaws that only became exasperated by where FromSoft goes to place DLC within the natural progression of Elden Ring. And how they chose to implement many of the new mechanics while leaning into in mine and many other creators who have critiqued the DLC's opinions and experiences. All of the absolute worst mechanics of not only Elden Ring but of the Soulsborne genre as a whole. I have played all of the Souls games, and I have over 1200 hours in Elden Ring. My favorite Souls game of all time to this day is still Bloodborne. You see, Portwin, please Miyazaki, more like this. And at the time of writing this script, I have just started getting into Sekiro. So I don't want to hear, haha, <laughs> get good casual, or any of that nonsense. And even if I didn't have years of experience, topless playthroughs and builds under my belt, it's long damn past time we've had an actual discussion about this growing issue. What made so many of the previous games so good was finding new and exciting ways to navigate the complexities and challenges of certain enemies and encounters. 
the very essence of hard but fair that the series was built on made multiple builds viable and encouraged exploration and problem solving to find new and more powerful ways to get around the challenges and to make your build and better to just grant greater and greater tools to solve these said problems. I'm going to quote Asmogol here and say, yeah, I played the Elden Ring DLC. I mean, I could beat it if I wanted to, but that is the problem because I don't want to. And that is indeed the problem. This is the very first FromSoft title I have ever played where I literally felt miserable for playing it, and I played Dark Souls 2. My first reaction to the base game was very similar, until I started to figure out how the game wanted me to play it, which is also a problem, and I called it out back then. When an open world wants you to play it in a certain way, it's no longer an open world game. It's just a really big world with an obscure linear path that you have to now figure out. And at the time, I could give Miyazaki and From Software the benefit of the doubt. This was their first open world game after all, and they were largely used to creating linear paths in games. But Shadow of the Erd Tree came out two years after the base game. And many individuals and content creators like myself in the Souls community have expressed their grievances with even the base game over that time. Grr, doing the fists only or bow only challenge build with very limited tools is a lot of fun every so often. But the true fun of the Soulsborne experience is experimenting with all the different tools and finding new and more innovative ways to get a build to come together. And the sad thing is, I feel like Brom is starting to take the Soul series in the wrong direction, leaning more and more into this Souls game hard meme and pushing more and more for this marketing ploy of any streamer plays a Souls game rather than sticking to what made the game good and expanding it especially as far as the boss mechanics and just overall game mechanics became what they became known for. Shadow of the Erd Tree is a prime example of this nonsense. Shadow of the Erd Tree feels like the first steps in a very different direction. And it is a direction I am truly not enjoying. And I am not the only one feeling this paradigm shift. Nor am I the only one having an issue with many of the design choices they've already chose to incorporate. So I'm gonna take this time to kind of expand on my biggest issues with these games. And some of these issues I have are shared by other creators. Some of them are just my own. Some of them might be a little nitpicky, but I don't wanna make this just about complaining. I honestly have some ideas to offer, some constructive criticism, if you will, to not only help redirect the series kind of back on a path of what made it enjoyable, also to kind of help expand upon the groundwork they already have laid out that is good and to keep the genre fresh and enjoyable moving forward. Number one is the open world is empty. DLC Shadow of the Earth Tree has the biggest problem with this. And I believe a lot of it had to do with where they chose to situate the DLC. And the base game, you start out low level. So exploring the world was really rewarding. There were dungeons, even if many of them were terrible copy pastas of one another, yes. But many of them had new spells, weapons, or summons, or some type of materials that you could find. Crafting materials, if you chose to interact with that part of the game, were really awesome. But upgrade materials, spells, summons, if you chose to interact with summons, and just items. So you just kept getting more and more tools to create a build with, or to try out different things. But the DLC, this wasn't the case. And I'm not even gonna call out the number of crafting materials, 
Because again, if you were using a crafting build or incorporating that into a build, they were welcome because there are plenty of new ones and plenty of new crafting items to come up with. But if you weren't, then yes, it was a horrible disappointment. I'm mainly calling out smithing stones and glob warts. And the absolute worst case scenario was the arrows and bolt. By this point, you should already have those bell bearings. So you can buy infinite numbers of them. And I get it. They were giving us new weapons to try out and maybe incorporate into our build. So the final tier of the crafting stones, that's fine. I get that why those were added in because those were very limited supply. But again, you could have added a new bell bearing or two new bell bearings that allowed us to purchase infinite of those rather than just vomiting random tier one smithing stones everywhere. Or why not rune items or something else that actually matters at this point in the DLC. And you may say, but the enemies drop runes, so why bother with more rune items? And I will touch base more on enemy rune drops and leveling in the DLC in just a bit. So I think what FromSoft could have done better in this was either starting the DLC after Vare's questline. So in other words, making the canonical actual time you are supposed to fight Moog set when he first gives you the item to travel to that area of the world. Or maybe expanding upon the number of scatter tree fragments and tying them less to progression. Again, I'll touch more on leveling and progression here in a bit. I think that would have made the world feel so much less empty. Alternatively, from could return to what they did best in past games and making the progression just linear, rather than having in this huge open world that's just empty. I feel like that would alleviate a lot of what the, even the base game's problems were. The combat and combat design of this game, even in base game, was bad. But the DLC, it's so much worse. Especially considering that it takes place as end game content. But right out the gate in the base game, it really felt like, especially when you fought the Grafted Scion, and I get it, it was supposed to kill you, but it really felt like the bosses were playing Sekiro. Well, we are still in Dark Souls 3. They jump, they flip, they flail around, and it feels like they have infinite stamina, or they're launching a non-stop spell spam. And all you can really do is like, kind of tumble around, maybe jump a bit or block, Shadow of the Erd Tree turns this insanity up to 11. The final boss being the absolute most egregious offender of this. His attack spam is merciless, with almost zero room for healing or to even let your stamina recover enough to get a hit in before he starts it all over again. Arena size spell effects with blinding lights and particle effects broken hitboxes that are multiple times worse than the hitboxes of Dark Souls 2. And Dark Souls 2 was hated for how awful its hitboxes were. 180, 360 degree turns, tracking that was god tier. Yeah, it's all here in the DLC. And the camera angles are truly some of the absolute worst nonsense I have seen since Dark Souls 2. The camera angles remind me of some of those Steam games that you see content creators just download to make a video about so they can laugh at it. That's how laughably bad these camera angles were. Like, seriously, the difficulty in this DLC especially is akin to the frenzied flame. It's all-consuming and burning everything in its path, pushing aside even the most important thing, which is balance and intent. Everything is expressly designed to frustrate or kill you with no rhyme or reason other than to lean into the meme of Souls Game Heart. Previous titles actually felt like each boss was a progression in difficulty. Each boss made sense, 
and they were balanced, at least for the most part. There's always outliers, but most of the enemies and bosses in previous From titles were properly balanced, and you could tackle them using any build available to the player. So when I started this video, I quoted Miyazaki saying, to feel fulfilled, you must first have a goal that needs fulfilling. But at the same time, it must actually be possible to fulfill said goal. The Elden Ring DLC does not feel either possible or fulfilling. It feels tedious, boring, and forced. How do we fix this problem? Go back to what made the games work in the first place. Stop leaning into the memes and streamer rage bait. Create new mechanics that encourage the player to learn and strategize with their builds. And I don't mean leaning into meme builds or cheese straps. I mean make legitimate design and new ideas. An excellent example of this is the deflecting hard tier. The deflecting hard tier is useless outside of wielding a shield. Wielding a shield was already broken. Once you built a ton of poise, I have found a massive high damage resistance shield. We didn't need more tools for a build that has worked since the very first Souls game. Blocking with a weapon while using the deflecting hard tier does not cause you to deflect enemy attacks. They continue their combo strain, often with their weapon literally phasing right through your own weapon. Whether it deals damage to your stamina or health or not during a perfect guard, doesn't matter if they don't stop swinging long enough for you to even make use of the mechanic. And this is such a perfect example of a new mechanic that FromSoft wasted. And the sad thing is, this mechanic isn't even new! Sekiro's gameplay is literally based around this mechanic, with perfect guarding dealing poise damage to the enemy, and often making their weapon bounce or deflect off of your weapon, giving you room to breathe or dodge or get a counterattack in. In fact, they allow you to swing into the enemy's swing, and both of you deflect off of each other. The sad thing is, other Souls-like games have already used this exact same mechanic, and they've done it better than FromSoft, outside of Sekiro. Having shields and parrying other mechanics also incorporated. This was such an excellent opportunity from Soft to harken back into Sekiro. They could have even added a fun little lore quick into the hard tier. They've already done this with other items. They've done it countless times in countless other ways in their game. So there's no excuse that they couldn't have done it. And it would have in turn also introduced a fun and rewarding new mechanic that players could have built around and attempted to master. But instead, they wasted it. So what's even more? Infuriating is if you parry a boss enemy, it causes them to bounce or deflect back. So the animation and mechanics are already in the game. They just need to be properly implemented and coded in for regular enemies. The base game and DLC even introduce talisman and crack tiers and other tools based around guard countering and using a deflect based playstyle. Another massive problem, especially in the DLC, is the unremarkable and unmemorable bosses and enemies. If you are watching this video right now and you followed it up to this point, it's probably because you either want to get into a Souls or Souls-like game, or you are a huge fan already of the series. You are open to discussion around ways to make it better. For the latter of you, or even for maybe the former, that have actually watched some of their favorite content creators, all of this accumulates into an open world that is a massive problem. And I mentioned before, 
that the base game was one of FromSoft's first open world games. So many of these mistakes are forgivable, like I said. However, the fact that the DLC doubles down on this ridiculous collectathon progression progression system with the scatter tree fragments is unforgivable. And yes, I am keenly aware that Skadu is actually pronounced a shadow in Old English. However, the entire concept of it is stupid, so I'm going to continue to call them stupid names to emphasize the point. And this is where we get into the problem with the DLC being endgame content and how the progression system breaks down and just becomes a tedious, monotonous flaw. The Scooby-Doo fragments are some of the worst offenders of it. Dark Souls 3 had two DLCs placed within the early to mid game so they can make use of the already really decent in-game progression system and seamlessly integrate them into the game's total design. The painted world of Ariane Dell could be accessed at any point once you reach the church bonfire in the Cathedral of the Deep. And the Ring City DLC could be reached directly after you defeated the final boss of the painted world of Ariandel, or at the very end of the game, if you chose to have it as end game content. They didn't need to come up with some arbitrary secondary progression system, forcing you to scour a near empty world filled with garbage drops that we already got tons of in the main game ahead of time. Or that you could now buy in bulk, or force you to use an absolutely useless map that doesn't actually show you how to reach different areas, because they're all through caves, or under undercroppings, or completely delete a underworld map. So now, when you're in these areas, you're completely lost and have no idea where to go. No, they incorporated all of that in. Bloodborne DLC was the same way. Even Dark Souls 2. And when I praise Dark Souls 2 for anything, you know we have a problem. Dark Souls 2 was one of the most hated games in the franchise, but it respected the player's progression and didn't choose to implement some secondary progression system that is so detached from the original content that it felt like it belonged in a separate game. So how do we fix the skibbity fragment system? Get rid of it! Not even being silly or trolling here. Get rid of it entirely. It served the purpose only to insult the player's time and effort that they put in long before they already got here. And to force exploration rather than to encourage the player's natural curiosity. You took an open world and forced it into a linear progression system and destroyed everything good you already had built up to this point. You scattered a limited 50 of these skadoosh items in random places that were never marked except by some garbage hand-drawn map, and then even worse, you cut in half the new spirit ash boss to 25, and did the exact same thing, scattered them everywhere. And honestly, if you really wanted to keep these items, you could have kept them, re-implemented them in a different way, creating a new and more creative mechanics that complement the time the player has already spent in progression and rewards them for exploring more, like adding special armor stats and bonuses, or using them to create consumable buffs. And you already did something awesome like that with the new Golden Vow, golden vow buff that we could make even better, make them infinite like the other progression and consumable items. However, make the total blessing that they give finite, with the remainder being able to be turned into runes. Because, once again, runes in the DLC were completely useless, considering how high level the player is. I went in at level 150, and the leveling was about pointless. Enemies dropped so few runes, and when I could level up, it was so few and far between, or so tiny, that it didn't matter. 
Just about anything honestly would have been better than the scrappy do blessing system we got. My biggest bitch and complaint about this DLC, and even the face game, but the DLC especially, is forcing players to play a game the way the creators want them to play, rather than how the player wants to play the game. Brum is so used to making a linear progression, I feel like they were completely lost on how to implement not only an open world, but an entire massive DLC into said open world without forcing players into some type of linear progression system. And the base game, like I said, did similar. Like if you went straight to market, and I did this, mind you, in my first playthrough, I made this mistake. As a new Carnage tour, you got rocked. Absolutely body the first time you fought him. And yeah, I get it. I've seen plenty of people beat the damn game at room level one. I don't care about those people. People that have 8 to 12 hours to practice and know like the game are not the type of people you want to base your metrics off of. I'm talking normal people. Players who have a couple hours, you know, maybe three, play your game. These type of players are the ones that got rolled if they went straight to Martin. And it upset a lot of players because on the map and going by what the NPCs said to do, it showed you that that was your linear progression system, and it wasn't. A lot of players complained about this until they realized they were supposed to go and explore the world and kind of start to figure out their build. And that was something that could be given because, again, FromSoft's first open world, so, ah, oh, okay, they, they didn't quite know how to handle this. Also, we were low level, so exploring felt rewarding and fun. There was so much content hidden around the world that you really didn't feel like you were missing out as you were exploring. And again, I emphasize, it's been two years since the base game. And you didn't improve this formula, and all you did was make it worse. The whole point of an open world game is to let players grow stronger, to explore and discover new tools and ways to engage with the mechanics and bosses and the various challenges set forth in your world. Why suddenly render all of that progress null and void and then make the players do the exact same thing again with less content, less reward, less level, and against far more overtuned, unmemorable, and blatantly annoying enemies and bosses? The biggest oxymoron in all of this is that the main bosses in Elden Ring are called Remembrance. And especially in the DLC, due to how much they flail about, they are less memorable and less of a remembrance than in previous Romsoft installments. Again, the fix for this is easy. Let players play the game. Let them enjoy their time. Have confidence in the world and in the mechanics you created for them to engage with. And also, big one, stop getting your feedback from Twitter, and I refuse to call it X, fuck you, Elon. And individuals who spend their entire life playing a game. Twitter and Facebook are already a dumpster fire, but someone who has no life other than video games is not a metric you should be measuring success by. This dismissive mindset is a direct result with the issues in game design and this is stemming from companies seeing streamers and content creators as free advertising and publicity. As a content creator myself, this is a great job security, sure, but I am not the only one in the content creation space calling these issues out. Other creators like Frog. Monkey, Game It Nika, Nasu, Type 3 Productions, Owlplay, Mr. Sketchhead, Amarillo, and many, many others. Just to name a few, have done similar reviews or made similar critiques of both Elden Ring and its DLC. I'm just adding my perspective to the mix, along with my own ideas on how this can be corrected and made it better for future games. Or else, I'm sorry, Thrones Off, that this genre is going to die.
along with the whole gaming industry, if we don't stop this nonsense of streamer reaction equal good game, do more of that. Because that mindset is no different than the whole loud equal funny mindset that used to permeate every single video on YouTube a few years back. But honestly, I want to end on a positive note, because I don't hate Elden Ring. In fact, quite contrary, I love the game. And there are so many good things that it and its DLC added. New weapons, like the perfumer bottle. They were just mwah, chef's kiss. The Smith's script weapon that, wow, have some flaws. Like, the inability to add grease to them. Why? And their weird stat scaling of light being fake. They, but at the same time, they added cool new tools for melee-focused builds to use as ranged options outside of investing in bows or clunky-ass crafting materials that you have to spend hours hunting down and grinding up a new focus on the verticality of the map. The base game thoroughly laughed at this. The base game didn't make any real use of the vertical sections of the map, even though the transitions in the DLC between one part of the map to the next, as far as the vertical to the lower part, was implemented terribly. I genuinely enjoyed how much better the vertical elements were implemented. It made me want to actually look up and see what was up above me, which allowed me to enjoy the next positive note, which was the design and aesthetics of the DLC. The DLC just looked so gorgeous in general. In fact, I'd argue the DLC was better than the main game. By quite a margin, I played it on PC, so the early experience for me was glitchy, and buggy, and just bad. But go with Elden Ring until it got patched. And, which is even further, the DLC patched and optimized itself for the PC faster than the base game ever did. So I was singing praises to FromSoft for getting it working at such a faster rate than they did with the base game. Overall, even though there is nothing memorable about combat outside of the boredom and misery it brought, everything else was very memorable. And it had me wanting to go back to the DLC, even if it's just to take a look at the lighting and shadow. And yes, I wrote shadow in old English in my script because I didn't know it like that. It all came together to create a true atmosphere and feeling of a world that has been ravaged by an endless war. I want to emphasize again how much I absolutely love Elden Ring and the Soulsborne genre as a whole. Loving so much it is physically painful for me to see it get a DLC like this and to see this be the end of Elden Ring's legacy. Breaks my heart to see any from soft game get slapped with such a horrible DLC and mechanic system with lackluster bosses and enemies like this. I wanted to like Elden Ring, even though the first time I played it, I was so horribly frustrated with the poor mechanics. But they played a more of it, and eventually I fell in love with it. But it didn't stop me from continuing to criticize all of the bad design elements and meany garbage that it chose to lean on. And I want to love the DLC just as much. But honestly, we are reaching a limit not only in what the game engine and most players can handle, especially as far as gimmicky, lately hyper aggressive spell spamming enemies go. So, and the DLC has already garnered so much backlash for taking this direction. After this, you lose people, myself included, because if the next title I see is Elden Ring 2, with, with more of this meany, gimmicky, bullshit nonsense, I'm sorry, he's off, he's off, he's off, I'm out. No, I'm gonna go elsewhere. To newer developers, like Liza P is a round eight studio, or even Steel Rising's Spider Studio. Because this didn't make me feel fulfilled by fulfilling a goal. It just made me feel empty. Just like the whole DLC one. 